Okay, our topic today is lockout, tagout, tryout. Um, I think this subject ranks right up there with, with our top three safety topics as far as importance in keeping people alive. Now, we, we do a lot of training on defensive driving and other things like that, which are, which are definitely important. But in the, in the pure safety realm of things, we do confined space, um, trenching and shoring, and, uh, and lockout tag. I think those are really the trifecta of, uh, of safety topics that really keep your fingers and toes attached and keep you alive. And so this is, this is an important one to me. I've seen, unfortunately, over the years where people have become injured, um, some of them seriously in this type of an incident, even had, a, had an uncle get wrapped up in a, in a conveyorized machine um, working as he was working as a maintenance technician there, and a new employee came in, flipped the switch, and uh, and he got wrapped up and and broke his arm in multiple places. Um, just a just a terrible thing. Could have been much worse worse for him. So this is an important topic. If you don't have a lockout tagout program at your organization and you have maintenance people working on machines you need to get to work on it and, uh, and put this in place for a number of reasons. One of those is it's a compliance obligation, but I don't think that's the most, uh, the most important thing by a long shot. Um, OSHA has this, uh, this standard 29 CFR 1910-147, and it requires you to, as an employer, to control hazardous energy anytime we are servicing or maintaining machines or equipment. Um, anywhere where unexpected energization could cause somebody to be could cause somebody to be injured or trapped or shocked or you name it burned, um, in places where we have a potential for the release of stored energy from a capacitor, uh, pressures, things like that that could cause injury. That's why we use lockout tagout and why it's such an important subject for us. So we talk about energy sources. The one that pops into mind is, is electricity um, because most of us have probably been shocked once and we don't ever want to have that happen again. We think about energy as electricity and it's, it's definitely important, but there are a whole bunch of other energy sources out there. Electrical, hydraulic, and pneumatic are really the most common, but there's other mechanical sources, gravity, um, chemical, radiation, hot water, um, all kinds of different energy sources. And this energy can either be active, think of an electric motor turning and turning a belt, um, driving a conveyor or driving a pump or something like that, versus um, stored energy. And this is something where that energy could be released suddenly um, and a good example of that would be a capacitor. If I have an electrical capacitor, it's charged up. It doesn't look like anything's happening. But if I touch those two, uh, two points on that capacitor, it could light me up. And that was, uh, that was uh, some great entertainment in, in high school physics classes. <laughs> We'd charge up capacitors and shock each other. Not a very bright thing to do. Um, but, that's, uh, but that's something that, that your people could run into. So. We've got to look at these energy sources, both active and stored energy. Something that is placed at elevation could also come down. Gravity could be stored energy and it could, it could crush somebody, okay? So when do we use it? It's when we're doing service or maintenance to equipment. Anytime we would remove a, a guard, a safety guard from a piece of equipment, bypass a safety device, device or put any part of our body inside of the point of operation or where it could become impacted by a piece of equipment. All right, there are a couple of exceptions on this and uh, one of those is cord and plug. If, if I have a um, drill, a corded drill, and I'm going to change the bit. What should I do to, to change that drill bit out? Well, I should unplug the piece of equipment and then change it. I don't have to lock it out. I don't have to put a uh, plug lockout on that because I am in exclusive control of that drill and the cord, and uh, nobody should be able to plug that in and shock me or wrap me up in that unexpectedly. Okay, But anything else, um, that is a piece of equipment and it's operated by a switch, it's operated by um, a breaker um, or some other energy control, um, those need to be locked out when we're doing that maintenance. 
All right. So there are two different two different kinds of employees involved in lockout tagout. One of those is an affected employee. If I'm the person operating that machine that gets shut off for maintenance, I'm affected by that. I'm not the person that's actually locking it out or doing the maintenance, but it affects my job. And so I'm an affected employee and I need to be trained that if I see a lock or a tag on a piece of equipment or the maintenance guy comes out and says, hey, we're gonna maintain this thing, don't do anything with it, that's what I need to do. And uh, not, not try to bypass anything to turn that machine back on. An authorized employee is the person who is actually doing the maintenance or the, or the service on the equipment. They need to be trained and authorized to lock out a, a, a piece of equipment. And they need to be knowledgeable of what hazards are there, what, what they need to do to totally isolate that piece of equipment. All right, another, another definition here is an energy isolating device. What the heck does that mean? Well, an energy isolating device is like this. Here's a switch. And if I, if I throw that switch, turn it off, um, that is something that breaks the, the flow of that energy. So it could be a switch, a valve, um, a circuit breaker, et cetera, et cetera. Lockout is a process. We have a lockout device. So this is something that I can, I can put on there. I put a lock, a tag, um, but this is a process to prevent energy from going into that system. So um, this device or this lockout process should ensure that there's only one key. So if I'm a mechanic and I'm going out to work on this equipment, I have the key for that lock and that's and, and there's there's no boss lock that's or box key that's out there that I can uh, master key that I can bypass that. I have the key. So for, for us to release that from lockout, I have to do it as the mechanic, the lead mechanic. All right, what if I have multiple people working on the same piece of equipment? Well, I can apply multiple locks. So, so each, each mechanic that is working on that piece of equipment should have their own lock. How do I put more than one lock on a piece of equipment? Well, I use what they call a hasp. And you can see that on there, probably bigger on the, on the slide, but I can put multiple locks on that hasp. What, uh, what if I run out of spots? Well, I can put another hasp on the original one. And I've seen situations where there have been dozens, if not hundreds of locks, because there were that many contractors working on um, this piece, giant piece of equipment. Okay, the, uh, the lead mechanic is the first to apply his or her lock and the last to remove it. Okay, tag out. So this is a lockout tag out uh, program. And so there is an option to just use a tag. I don't recommend it, but every lock should have a tag with it. So we can identify who was responsible for locking this out, when it, when it became locked, locked out, and, uh, and what's really going on with it, okay? All right. So we have an authorized employee that locks this out. They have the responsibility to notify, notify the affected employees. I'm taking this machine out of service. It will be locked out. Do not try to uh, try to turn it back on. Okay. And they are going to apply a lock and tag to each energy isolating device. It's not just the power. It's the pneumatic. It's the hydraulic. It's all of whatever energy sources are um, attached to that piece of equipment that could pose a hazard, hazard to um, to that employee or others need to be locked out prior to the work taking place. Okay, supervisors are, are responsible to ensure that we're doing lockout tag out right. Um, they also are responsible to coordinate training for employees so they know what's happening and, and what it means when there's a lock or a tag in place. Okay, management of course has responsibility to have a written lockout tag out policy. If you, if you don't have one of those in place, give us a call. We'd be happy to help you with the boilerplate policy and give you some, some guidance on how to put that together. Um, they want to, they look at the program and make sure it's working. If we find some situations where people weren't locking things out or our procedures weren't accurate and we missed a, uh, maybe we missed an energy source or something like that, well, that's a problem. And so the management has the responsibility to get that, uh, to get that fixed. And so our program is effective. All right. 
for different types of equipment, they have different energy sources and different hazards. And so we need to identify each one of those and each e piece of equipment should have its own equipment specific lockout tagout procedure. Now for some of those, it's really simple. I've got a, I've got a, a big piece of equipment up, but all it has is one electrical, um, one electrical plug, and that's all of the energy sources that that are potentially hazardous to me. Here's my big plug, and I and I put I unplug it, and I put that plug cover and a lock and a tag on it, and I've and I've taken care of that. For others that have multiple uh, energy sources this procedure could get to be very detailed. Here's an example of, uh, of uh, one organization's lockout tagout procedure. Now, does this need to be on every machine? Yeah, under OSHA, each machine should have its own lockout tagout procedure. Okay. All right, so let's run through the steps of lockout tagout quickly. Step one is testing and diagnostics. Uh, the authorized employee tells all of the affected employees in the area that, hey, this is going to happen. They inspect the work area to make sure it's ready for maintenance and, uh, and make sure all the components are intact and they have everything that they need um, before, they, before they take it out. Step two is equipment shutdown and isolation. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's probably going to look very similar to your normal shutdown process. However, there may be situations where we, we have a different procedure um, to totally isolate the piece of equipment. So we shut it down, all energy sources are located, and that's part of our procedure is where are, where are they? If it's a breaker, uh, it, that procedure should say it's in this panel, uh, breaker panel, and you should go there and uh, put your lock, turn it off, and then apply your lockout device at that location. Okay, so each, ice, each energy source needs its own lockout. All right, next one, lockout procedure, de-energization. After, um, after the equipment's been locked out, we need to release any stored or residual energy that might be there. Well, how do I do that? Sometimes it is from pushing a button um, to, uh, uh, to release that. Sometimes it's opening a valve. Sometimes it is, it is grounding um, a, uh, an electrical circuit. Um, if I've got a capacitor or something like that, um, there will be a process to release any stored energy. Okay. Oh, and on that, uh, let me go back to that slide. Um, sometimes I may need to block. Remember, we talked about that there, there if there's something um, at heights, uh, maybe a machine thinking of like a press that goes up and down and it's up at that high point. Well, we may either need to lower that to the bottom or we may need to block that up to prevent it from, from coming down. All right. Um, Step four, verification of isolation. This is the tryout part of lockout tagout tryout. We need to test that. And that could be as simple as pushing the start button. Um, if that's the procedure that, that uh, you've determined for that equipment works, it could be using a voltmeter to verify that there's no electricity still in that circuit. Now I've seen some scary situations where a single electrical panel had two energy sources. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty risky. Um, sometimes we may have backup power. You've got a generator or some, or some backup uh, batteries that uh, are designed to keep, keep things functioning, especially computer, computerized equipment. That's a real risk. So, uh, you know, you think about your computer in your office. I, if I unplug from the wall, I may think I'm protected, but there may be um, a battery backup box, that thing that makes noise under your desk, that could, that could shock me in the event that I don't isolate that as well, okay? All right, oh, and after you get done doing that test, put all of your switches back into the off position. All right, step five, um, no time on that one, do your service, fix whatever it is. And then after that, we're gonna do some post-service testing, make sure it works. Um, we uh, will inspect the area for tools and things like that to make sure that they don't, um, they don't uh, get wrapped up in a machine or get thrown out of a machine when we turn it on. Um, when we're doing testing, we only remove the locks um, that are necessary to test that piece of equipment. Okay, sometimes we have to do that, turn it on briefly, um, 
to be able to verify that whatever the maintenance is that we did on that equipment worked and that things rotate in the right way and, and clearances are right. We test that operation. Okay. After we've done that testing and it's ready to go, we're going to release it from, from lockout. Um, so we ensure that the area is clean and, and safe and protected for, you know, so the, so the machine can operate and the lead mechanic will notify those affected employees, the operators, that the lockout is, in, is complete and we're turning the machine back over to them. Okay. All right. What happens if this, if this maintenance goes into multiple shifts? It's broken and and uh, and we don't finish it up during first shift, and so somebody else comes in to work on it. Well, we can maintain our lock our lockout, um, but we have to do it in a specific way, and that is when one mechanic takes their lock off, the person taking their place puts their lock on, so everybody that is working on it is protected by their own lock. Okay. All right. Can you ever cut a lock off? We can't find this guy, the, me the mechanic is missing. Um, and so we're gonna cut his lock off. Well, what if he's inside of the machine? This is a very, uh, we have very limited circumstances where we can cut a lock off and remove a lock like that. And that's when we verify that the employee is not at the facility. So this guy, this guy worked here uh, six months ago and he put his lock on this breaker and uh, he doesn't work here anymore. He's been gone for a long time, but his lock's still there, and we don't have the we don't have the key because he because he controlled that. Well, in those situations, if we can verify the employee is not there anymore, verify that he's not in the in the piece of equipment, then we can cut that lock off. We do have to have to have a procedure to do that and document what we what we did. Make sure uh, management knows that we're doing those things. Lockout tag out is in that this is a real quick, real quick overview. This is a, this is serious business. Um, don't take chances. Don't cut corners um, because these are where some of the most serious industrial type accidents take place. And uh, and it's simple. Put a process in place and do it right every time. And then we'll then we will uh, keep our fingers and toes in place and stay alive for an, for another day. Um, all right, that is the procedure or that is the presentation for right now. If uh, any of you have questions or comments, please go ahead and type those into the chat box and we'll answer those those right now. Doug and Brent, what did I miss this time? Anything? Jason, that was excellent, Jason. Job covering it. Great job. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. I'm not seeing any questions come in on the chat box so we're gonna we're gonna wrap that up today once again important subject if you if you're a little lacking on your on your lockout tag out give us a call brent doug and myself are happy to happy to help you with that program and uh, give you some ideas of how to how to easily and quickly put it into place to keep your people safe out there all right thanks folks be safe out there go have a safe day